Welcome to the Grow Your Business and Grow Your Wealth podcast with Gary Helt. Gary is an expert in helping business owners put together a plan that will provide a better future for their businesses, themselves, and their families. On the podcast, Gary interviews other professionals who share his vision, and together they share secrets and strategies any business owner can use to build a better financial foundation for your business and your life. Welcome back to the podcast. This uh, week, our guest is Adrian Woods with the Law Offices of Adrian Woods. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Gary. So t- tell us, what was it, it uh, about law that got you so interested? Well, law in general is, um, I mean, our, our society is built on it. Um, law is what tells us what we can do, what we can't do, uh, provides us with guidelines that we can count on or should be able to count on. Um, and I, I tend to be a little bit on the type A side. I, I like order. I like things to be in a certain way. So it appealed to me. It appealed to my orderly sense. Gotcha. So what made you then concentrate? Because you, you concentrate in bankruptcy and, and mm-hmm. uh, re- restructuring. What made you pick that? Well, um, you know, growing up, my parents had a small business, have a small business still. And, you know, I, I see what small businesses go through. I see what individuals go through. And I it's a great mechanism for helping people. I also like the problem solving aspect of bankruptcy. You know, you can undo a lot of the things you do in other areas of law, like contract, landlord, tenant. Um, you can undo things in bankruptcy. So it's really sort of a fun puzzle. And you get to help people. Right. So, you know, tell us, I mean, you know, obviously bankruptcy laws have changed drastically over the years. Um, And, you know, there used to be, you know, such a huge stigma on anybody that claimed bankruptcy. Can you kind of give us a little background on the, the, I'm going to say the evolution of bankruptcy? Yeah, I mean, I think the evolution of bankruptcy really kind of started with, you know, our founding of the country. Um, So one of the principles, one of the founding principles of America was that there shouldn't be a debtor's prison, right? Um, That people, if we wanted society to be able to build and evolve, then you needed a certain amount of um, willingness to take calculated risks. And, you know, threatening to throw people in prison if they can't pay their bills wouldn't necessarily be very good for that for obvious reasons. Um, And, you know, I'm going to say that there still is a stigma that's attached to bankruptcy, but I think that it's, it's really largely unfair because, you know, if you think about it, you know, first of all, it was a founding principle, but even aside from that, um, life happens. Um, you, You can't necessarily count on, Um, the economy working in your favor or, you know, the job that you have today being available tomorrow. Um, And so I do think that people are becoming, um, as as they fall on difficult times, I think people are becoming more and more accustomed to the fact that this is an available mechanism to manage your debt. It's not a failure. Um, It can help you restructure. It can help you liquidate. It really depends on what your needs are. Um, but it's not a failure. It's a way of addressing a problem that you have. Right. So, you know, we've, I, I don't want to say we've come out of the pandemic, but it seems like we're on on the back half of that. How have you seen um, that affect bankruptcy and the number of people that are, that are claiming bankruptcy or just the, the process itself? So um, during the pandemic, and really for the the decade that preceded the pandemic, um, bankruptcies were relatively low. Um, During the pandemic, they dropped even more substantially, though, because as as we all probably recall, you know, March 2020, the Fed dropped interest rates down to zero. Um, There was a lot of stimulus money out there. There were PPP loans, idle loans, enhanced unemployment. Um, And there were also bars to creditors collecting against debtors. So, you know, we had an eviction moratorium, we had a foreclosure moratorium, and the courts were by and large closed. Um, Additionally, banks were giving internal guidance not to call things bad debt, because, you know, once you call something bad debt, it's got to be paid off before it can be a performing asset again, and they have their own obligations to the regulatory authorities. Now, 
post pandemic, we're seeing that, you know, gone are the days of stimulus checks and PPP loans. Uh, the eviction and foreclosure moratoriums are over. And we're still dealing with a lot of the issues that plagued us during the pandemic, like labor and supply shortages. Um, People are forced to pay more for materials. Businesses are faced with the need to pay employees more. And many are actually complaining that they still can't find qualified workers. Yep. Um, so it hasn't necessarily increased as significantly as I think it's going to. But over the past month, we did see a pretty significant uptick from the month prior. Um, and also, you know, of course, interest rates, it's, it's no secret, are rising substantially. Um, credit card rates right now, I believe, are at a 30-year high with the average being around 18.5%. Um, and credit card spending, which was down significantly during the pandemic, has jumped to a 20-year high. And so people are definitely relying more on debt to pay their bills. And most people live uh, paycheck to paycheck. Um, last month, about a third of small businesses could not afford to pay their rent. And when you think that that's the largest employer really in the country, small businesses, that's going to have a significant trickle down effect. Right. So, you know, in going through this, if, if I were somebody that, that my business, I was having, you know, problems, a on employees and, and paying finances and, and things like that, um, kind of what are my, what are my options? Um, you know, that I have coming into to bankruptcy? Well, I mean, it's really a very individualized process. Um, people who try to sell bankruptcy as, as sort of um, a one, one, um, one fit fits all, it, it's not really the accurate way of looking at it. It's a very individualized process where you sit down with someone and you really discuss the big picture. So for instance, you know, I've had a lot of people come to me over the past few months who have had difficulties paying their leases. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, the economy was really doing quite well. And a lot of people use that as an opportunity to expand. Expansion often means leasing larger spaces, be it for office, for manufacturing or, or whatnot. Um, and then, you know, during the pandemic, obviously, there was a lot of work from home. Um, a lot of people still don't really feel safe going back to offices. And yet employers, large and smaller, are still looking at significantly larger spaces and in many cases, more expensive spaces than what they either need, want or can afford. Um, one thing you can do in bankruptcy is reject leases. Um, you can mitigate the damages that you would otherwise owe to a landlord in that manner. Um, you can also assign things that have anti-assignment clauses because anti-assignment clauses are voided in bankruptcy. Um, you can reject executory contracts that are no longer favorable. I think it's no secret that the way that we do business today, the things people buy um, and spend money on has changed substantially due to, I think in part the pandemic, so if you have a contract where you have to buy 30,000 widgets every month, that may no longer be feasible or desirable. Mm -hmm. um, and these are just a few of the things you can accomplish in a bankruptcy. So what advice would you give somebody? It's like, okay, my, my, my business is troubled and I need to, to put cash into my business. So I go out and I personally borrow that money to then put into my company. So uh, what advice would you have for somebody if that's if that's what they were trying to do? So, I mean, in small businesses, oftentimes um, the small business owner is funding the business on some level. If they're not doing it directly, generally speaking, they are personally guaranteeing leases and loans and contracts. Um, one of the really nice things um, about bankruptcy is that, so you may or may not be familiar with something called the means test. This is something that was established back during the amendments of 2005 that were enacted in 2007. And basically, it took a lot of the judgment out of the hands of judges to decide who should and should not be eligible for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And it put in um, sort of a 
a bright line rule, if you will. If you make over a certain amount, then you don't qualify. You don't need to qualify for the means test if more than half of your debts as an individual are derived from business debts. So the, the presumption of, of fraud doesn't arise essentially. So that's one answer. But of course, that's a liquidation bankruptcy. Not everybody wants that. Um, right. There are also restructuring options available. So, I mean, is there, if I'm, you know, again, I'm, I'm, you know, borrowing against my home equity loan and then I'm putting that cash in, into the business is, is there, you know, from, from a tax guy standpoint, I'm saying you're, you know, you put it in there as a capital contribution so you can write the loss off, but mm -hmm. should I be doing it that way or should I be doing a loan document? What, what can I uh, do to help protect you know, yes, I, I see what you're saying. Companies. Well, I mean, the problem is that whenever an individual business owner um, contributes money, you will have to to a business, you will have a group of creditors who will try to recharacterize it as an equity investment rather than a loan, no matter what. So you kind of hit the nail right on the head, Gary, when you said a loan document, that is definitely the first step. Um, you want to make sure that it is well documented, and you also want to make sure that it's contemporaneously documented, meaning, you know, don't put the contribution in today and then a year from now say, you know, shoot, it looks like the business is in trouble, better put that loan document together, um, because that obviously is going to face some enhanced scrutiny. Um, also, you know, to the extent that you can, you want to make sure that your loan is a secured loan. So if the business has assets and you are able, you know, unencumbered assets that you can attach, you want to make sure that you have the standing as a secured creditor so that that way you're a little bit further up in the pecking order in terms of getting paid. Now, that's not a guarantee that the court or a creditor won't try to recharacterize it as equity, but it makes it a little bit more palatable to say, no, this was a legitimate loan to the business. Great. So, you know, we, we, we seem to be in a definitely in a, a DIY society these days. Um, you know, I always preach to anybody that, you know, when it comes to anything from a, a legal tax, you know, a state matter type thing, don't do the DIY, don't go online. What advice do you have for somebody who is going to try to navigate bankruptcy on their own? I would say, look, I mean, some people can do it on their own, but the problem is you don't know that. You don't know until you actually sit down and talk to a professional. I always offer a free consultation to anyone who has questions. Um, I want to, A, make sure I help people, but also make sure that I'm the right fit for that particular client. Um, and, you know, hiring an attorney like hiring an accountant, it's a very special relationship. It's, it's a relationship of trust or fiduciaries. Um, and, you know, we need to make sure we're a good fit. I think that one thing that I would note definitely is that um, I have represented a lot of attorneys over the years in bankruptcy matters. You know, these are people who are very well educated, very smart, very good at what they do, and they're smart enough to know what they don't know. Um, and we've all heard the old adage that only a fool represents himself. I think that's very true because it's very hard to be objective and analytical when it's your life that's involved. You know, are you really going to be rational and objective and clear when you're making your arguments if you're impassioned? Um, and I would argue no. <laughs> right. I, I agree with you 100%. I always try to tell people, and, and that's why we do our jobs well, is because we're able to remove the emotion of it and look at it from a more strategic standpoint than you do if, if you were doing it, um, you know, on, on your own. Um, besides talking to a professional uh, about going, going through bankruptcy, uh, if somebody came to you, what's, I guess, what's the first advice that you would that you would give them when they're uh, thinking about entering into bankruptcy? 
aggregate a list of all of your assets and all of your liabilities because any conversation with a bankruptcy attorney will start there um, because you know there are certain things that are exempt there are certain things that are not exempt but I would say you know sometimes I wish I could talk to people before they came to me right. because invariably people will come to me after they've done things that I would advise them not to. Um, many people don't realize, for instance, that retirement funds are generally exempt. So I've had a number of people come to me and say, you know, I've been trying to pay off this debt for the past year. In fact, I wiped out my entire 401k and I just sort of cringe Gary because it's like, yeah. no, you, you, that whole slow motion stop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, at that point, it's too late. You can't put it back and pretend it didn't happen because it did, in fact, happen. Right. Um, similarly, a lot of people don't realize what taxes are and aren't dischargeable. Um, I had a gentleman come to me a couple of years ago, and he said he needed to file for bankruptcy because he owed about $12 million worth of taxes for his business to the IRS. Wow. Um, he had been paying a lot of other things out of his pocket. And really, you know, meant to do the right thing. He was just trying to keep his business afloat. Unfortunately, he didn't realize that certain taxes are designated as trust fund taxes mm -hmm. um, and they are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. So I would say that if anyone has a question, if they're having a problem meeting their financial obligations, either personally or for their business as they become due, or if they even see a problem on the horizon, it makes sense to have a conversation because when I say bankruptcy, I really want to impress upon people financial restructuring. You know, that this is a way to analyze everything that's going on in your financial world and try to make it sustainable. And if your burn rate isn't sustainable today, it's probably not going to be sustainable next week either. Right. I think lots of times, you know, when, when, you know, again, lots of times people think of bankruptcy, okay, I'm going to go into it, it's going to wipe all my debt away, and I get the re I get to start over. But then some people are like, well, I don't want to do that to other people, because I have other businesses that I owe that trusted me. And if I do this, then I'm going to hurt them. Um and you've talked, okay, there's re, there's restructuring uh, that. Can you go into that a little bit about, you know, what that kind of looks like? Sure, absolutely. So when you're talking about a restructuring, um, bankruptcy creditors get paid on a waterfall. So individuals who have secured claims will get paid first. Um, you know, after that are priority claims, like certain types of taxes or, you know, certain other types of claims. And then Further down the line, you have general and secure creditors, and that'll be most of the people I think that you're probably referring to, you know, the vendors, the service providers, right. the people who sell us the widgets and, and clean the office. Um, and then way at the bottom below them is equity, you know, the people who actually own the business. Um, and a lot of people do have a very difficult time countenancing that they are not going to pay their vendors and service providers particularly I find the small businesses, because a lot of times there's a personal relationship there um, and they feel bad. You know, I, I think most people that come to me feel bad about not being able to pay their debts. Um, they don't they don't want to, you know, create financial hardship for people that they've done business with for years and they're embarrassed. Um, but what I always point out to them is, listen, this vendor wants you to recover so that you can continue in business so that you can basically live to buy widgets another day, if you will. Right. Um, you also need to think about your employees. You know, you have obligations to keep people employed. And if your business goes under because you're going to use your last dollar to pay the vendor instead of restructuring your obligations so you can continue, then there's a whole group of people now who are out of work um, because you tried to do the right thing but you didn't do it in an educated manner. Right. So the, when we go about the, you know, doing it through, through a restructuring, mm -hmm. that kind of is just, I'm going to say, defend off the wolves until we can put together a plan. 
That's a big part of it. So once you file a bankruptcy, the automatic stay comes into effect and that bars any actions to collect against the debtor. Um, in some cases, that can also be extended to the principal. And I've successfully made that argument in small business cases where the principal and the debtor are so closely intertwined that to distract the principal would be to decimate the chance of the business's success in reorganizing. Um, so that provides a period, what we call a breathing spell, um, where people can sort of determine, you know, you get your bearings. It's like any time you're, your Delta shocking situation, right? You need to sort of have a moment of quiet to regroup and logically think about, okay, so these are my problems, how do I solve them? And ultimately that builds up to filing a plan of reorganization. In some cases, you know, under subchapter five of chapter 11, which is geared towards small businesses with less than seven and a half million dollars worth of debt, um, the court decides whether or not the plan is confirmable. In larger cases, uh, the creditors will vote and their vote decides whether or not the plan is confirmable. Um, but ultimately, yes, um, you're getting a breathing spell, you're developing a plan, and you get it confirmed, and, and then you carry on. So during this time, I mean, you know, that that this breathing spell, if you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, putting together my plan, I'm still able to continue with my business, correct? Generally speaking, yes. So if you file a voluntary Chapter 11 bankruptcy, you are what is called a debtor in possession. And you can go about running your business as you always have. You can hire people, you can fire people, you can buy things, you can sell things, anything that you would normally do in the ordinary course of running your business. Now, you can't do extraordinary things. You can't take out loans without court approval. But you can actually accomplish a lot of the things that you would want to do with court approval. So that's, you know, that's the trade-off. You, you do have to answer to the court for some things, but in general, you can continue to operate as you always have. Right. So if I'm buying widgets, I'm able to pay for those widgets, even though it's the same person that I'm buying from, correct? Yes. And actually, people will probably be more than happy to continue doing business with you post-petition because you're what's deemed an administrative creditor, meaning that they get paid before anybody else, okay. um, aside from you know secured creditors who get paid from their security interest. So... I can pay them. I just can't for, for the current stuff. I just can't pay for any of the back stuff. Correct. You can't pay post, you can't pay pre-petition obligations with post-petition money outside of a plan or a court order. Um, and, you know, that'll commonly come up where if people owe money to employees for the pre-petition period, you would file a motion with the court seeking approval to pay the employees for that period of time. Um, and it really is a hard and fast rule. You can't do it without court approval or outside of a plan, but if there's a good business reason for doing it, then the court will approve it. And generally courts defer to the business judgment of the debtor. Okay. Now, in going through bankruptcy, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you people see people make when they do this? Ooh. Um, trying to pay people that they want to see paid right before filing the bankruptcy. Um, a lot of people don't realize that payments that you make during the 90 days before the petition date um, are analyzed as preferences, um, meaning that even if a person provides you with goods or services, if they receive payment for those goods or services with certain exceptions during the 90 days before the bankruptcy, then that money can be clawed back into the bankruptcy estate. Right. So that's a big one. Um, another one is, you know, just generally trying to transfer funds outside of the debtor um, for no consideration to other related entities, um, thinking that that'll be a way to save money and, and essentially keep it from creditors. Um, those transactions can generally be undone. Um, but I would say the biggest mistake that I see people make in terms of just honest mistakes is waiting too long um, because funding a bankruptcy, look, bankruptcy is not free. 
unfortunately, it costs money. Um, it costs money to pay your attorneys, it costs money to pay your financial advisor. But at the end of the day, you know, it's like going into surgery. You hope you come out and you're able to function better. And that's the whole point. Um, so it's worth paying the money to do it. But if you wait too long and you can't fund your administrative expenses and you're deemed administratively insolvent, um, if you've already lost the faith of all of your lenders, if people are no longer willing to work with you because the check's been in the mail for too long, um, then you have pretty much damned your bankruptcy to failure. Right. Now, what about, you know, you, you talked about the 90 days in, in, you know, paying people and so forth. What about um, uh, borrowing during that that time or not even borrowing, but maybe buying on credit or, you know, running up your credit cards and things like that, knowing that you're going to be claiming, you know, bankruptcy? Do those vendors or, or, or uh, lenders or anything have anything that they can go after you for? Well, yes, that would be fraud. Okay. <laughs> so basically, if, if you are knowingly spending money that you know you are planning to discharge, um, then that is a fraudulent act and that money can be clawed back. Um, and the vendors might have claims against you for essentially they, they can seek to have your debt to them deemed non-dischargeable in the case of an individual um, or in a, you know, in a business that's reorganizing, they could seek to have that, you know, be paid at a higher amount because of the fact that this was a fraudulent act. Okay. You know, businesses don't technically get a discharge. They either continue to operate or they cease to operate. And then, you know, payments are made under the plan if they continue to operate. Right. I mean, but it, it's good to know that if, if, you know, you're trying to be helpful and somebody does this that you do have recourse um to, to hopefully put you in a little bit better position than everybody else um again bankruptcy we could probably talk for a week about all of this um what have i not asked you that you wish i had hmm that's a tough one because you, you <laughs> actually had some really good questions um <laughs> I guess. Hmm. So let me let me throw another one out there to you. So <laughs> if somebody starts down the road of bankruptcy, and I know every case is is different, I guess what's the average time span of a of a restructuring bankruptcy? You know, that's actually a good question. And one thing I was just thinking is that I would want to point out to people that it is not the terrible, painful process that a lot of people think it is. So for an individual bankruptcy, um, you know, if we're talking about a chapter seven liquidation, um, generally we're done in six months. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about a small business case, you know, you have to, you have to file your plan within the first 90 days. Okay. So yeah, yeah, the plan can be amended a few times, so that's not unusual. But at the end of the day, the bankruptcy system is meant to be streamlined, um, and the judges tend to be very much aware of the fact that they do not want to see a debtor linger in bankruptcy. They want to see relatively quickly, is this debtor able to restructure or not? Um, and I do find that you know, the, the Southern District of New York, the Eastern District of New York, where I practice, um, the judges are very business savvy people and they understand the nuances of how businesses are run and they can learn pretty quickly if it's a new type of business structure that they haven't dealt with before. Um, so they have a general idea, I think, of whether or not the budgets that you're putting in make sense. Um, and so it does tend to go pretty quickly because you're dealing with, you know, a, a very high caliber um, justice system. Right. So people like what they hear and they want to uh, talk to you to get some help or, or maybe just bounce some questions off you. How can they reach out to you? Well, the best way to reach me is either by email at Adrian, A-D-R-I-E-N-N-E -N -N -E, at woodslawpc.com. Or you can call me at 
347-4321. Great. I really appreciate your time today and your wisdom on this, because this, I, I think that with the way the economy is going, we may unfortunately see more of this uh, you know, going on. So it's great to, to be able to talk about it and, and hopefully get out in front of it. Yeah, I suspect you're right, Gary. And, you know, I'm glad to let people know that there is actually help and there's a way out. Great. Thank you. This week, our guest was Adrian Woods with the Law Office of Adrian Woods. Thank you. And I'll see you guys next week. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.